Guten Morgen, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, introduction and uh, uh, thank you to be awake so early. Uh, uh, you, you started with, uh, with the idea of uh, cultural diversity. I think uh, this uh, first panel is uh, indeed uh, representing uh, cultural diversity. That means uh, different people from different parts of the world uh, with uh, different uh, relation to, uh, to the arts. Uh, as uh, Barbara Unmusik uh, told us that uh, this conference is to make a contribution to influence the cultural policy of the future, uh, we will start uh, with uh, some ideas about that, uh, coming from the background uh, of uh, these uh, uh, special guests. Uh, we are together. That means that this... Uh, um, first panel is uh, also to give uh, um, a little bit the framework of that, what uh, we will discuss in the next uh, two days. So uh, it's up to us uh, to um, raise uh, uh, quest more questions and uh, give uh, introductions uh, to other um, uh, debates. Uh, we are starting... Uh, and uh, this is why I will uh, introduce you uh, only for the first speaker and then uh, uh, later for the others. Uh, we are starting with uh, Basma El Husaini from Egypt. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to sit again close to you and to be with you uh, because uh, uh, if you are in the Arabic countries, uh, there is no uh, need to introduce her. Uh, she is a very well-known activist in the in the cultural field. She is managing director of Al Mahret Al Tagafi, a non-profit organization of cultural resources, supporting young artists, stimulating cultural exchange within the Arab, Arab region. I met her last uh, December in Cairo, uh, where she, together uh, with the Goethe Institute, started. Uh, uh, a conference ab about uh, culture and politics. So I think this is uh, the second part. We can continue, but uh, we will uh, um, guide you uh, through some uh, observations uh, from the point of view from Basma. It's your podium. Please uh, start with the introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schneider. Uh, it's a challenge to be speaking in the first plenary session. And I think it's even more a challenge for me because I'm talking on uh, what sounds to be a theoretical subject, art and social transform transformation. I'm not usually a theoretical person. I'm a very practical person rushing around to do things all the time. I never have the time to, talk, to think about theory. So anyway, here is my two cents of theoretical talk, and uh, I am uh, kind of experimenting with you. Um, there are many arguments why art is important. Some of these arguments focus on the utility of art as a conduit for critiquing social norms and political practices. Its value as a carrier of collective memory and history, its ability to conserve national identity, or its very useful contribution to the economy. These are all very valid and very important arguments, but I would like to talk about another aspect of how artistic expression, production, and activity can be essential for social change. What happens when someone writes a poem, takes up acting, plays a musical instrument, or paints an image that has been hanging in his or her head? Of course, many things happen. She or he discovers they need more training, Neighbors complain. <laughs> he or she worries about what other people think of the work. Friends and family love what they do. But the most important thing that happens is that this person becomes more powerful. They obtain power over things that are beyond their immediate reality 
And this transformation on the individual level is hardly only a personal matter. Creativity or the power of imagining things that cannot be immediately perceived by our five senses is a personal ability, but its impact goes far beyond any particular individual. This power is contagious. Receiving or interacting with creativity is empowering. Perhaps I use the word empowering in a liberal way. What I mean is that participating in an act of creativity enables people to feel and think beyond their immediate reality and outside their usual capacity. How can this be useful in a process of social change? I would argue that the creative power is one of the most essential assets during social change. To get a society to change the values and norms that hinder its prosperity and well-being, to do this, you can use the media, or you can use art as media, and, of course, you can use force. But the change will not happen until this society wants to change. The desire for change is mostly fed by the power of creativity, the ability to think and feel beyond reality. How can people want change if they lack the ability to imagine what it would look like? No way. Another thought about how art is vital for social change. I think we all agree that the process of changing social values and norms is a long and complicated one. Such a process involves small and big changes on the political, economic, and moral levels. Often, this process is not a rewarding one on the short term, because the changes are hardly visible at the time they happen. You cannot see them when they happen. The best example of this, as probably you all know, is Europe over the past two centuries. It is only through art that these changes can be accumulated, can be distilled, and then express, expressed in forms that can be understood by people and people can relate to. Now, now that I have shared some of these uh, theoretical remarks about the value of art during social transformation, I will move to the topic that you probably expect me to talk about, the Arab Spring. <laughs> it is only 13 months ago that a massive popular protest movement started in Tunis and resulted in major political changes in four countries in the region, Tunis, Libya, Egypt, and Yemen, and an ongoing struggle for freedom in Syria and Bahrain. These changes, as you all know, happen in a region when, where the word change was only used to describe the passing of power by an aging dictator to his son. It's not surprising that then that the whole world is giving these movements such attention and even admiration. I'm not going to attempt to give you any kind of political analysis of the situation in Egypt, my country, or the rest of the region, as I am no political analyst. And quite frankly, even the best international political analysts have not been able to explain or predict the ongoing changes or where they are going. I want to share with you some uh, initial remarks or observations on, social, on the social aspects of the ongoing political changes. These observations are an attempt to explore the impact of the political changes on the society's value system. My first observation is about age. As you have seen on television, these revolutions were, are led by young people. The vast majority of people taking to the streets are young men and women. More than 90% of those killed by the old regimes are under the age of 35. In Egypt, 75% of the victims are under the age of 25. Almost all effective activists who are in organizing sit-ins and demonstrations, uh, printing and distributing uh, political leaflets, blogging, making videos, etc., are between the age of 20 and 35 years old. 
This is natural in a region where the majority of the population is under 35 years old. And with the current population growth rate, this ratio is rising. Yet, in the four countries where the heads of the, of the old regimes have been overthrown, this is Tunis, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, and where some sort of uh, democratic process has started, it looks like the new political scene is dominated, in some cases entirely, by people who are over 60 years old. In the recent Egyptian parliamentary elections, out of the 498 members of the parliament, less than 10% are under the age of 40. My second observation is about women. As you may have seen on television, women were at the forefront of the political protests, uh, in most cases with men and in some cases in women-only demonstrations. Some of the most outspoken and world-known uh, faces of the Arab revolutions are women. Nawara Negm from Egypt, Samar Yazbak from Syria, uh, Tawakkul Karaman from Yemen, and many more. Many of the most important civic initiatives in, in Egypt in particular, like no to military trials, which was a big movement started some months ago against the uh, trials of civilians under military law, El Fanni Miram, which is a cultural initiative, and we will not forget, which is an initiative to commemorate the, those killed by the Mubarak regime and those who continue to be killed until today. All these initiatives were initiated and led by women. Again, despite this, only six women, all, under, all over the age of 40, have been elected in the new parliament. My last observation is about social class. Social justice was right at the very top of protest demands in Tunis, Egypt, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, and to a lesser extent, Libya. <laughs> Even though poorer people did not participate in large numbers in the protests in Egypt at the beginning of the revolution, the slogans raised by the revolutionaries were predominantly about removing social injustice. Since February 2011, poorer people, mostly from urban slum areas around Cairo, constituted the majority of people protesting against military rule in Egypt. However, in Egypt, as well as in Tunis, the newly elected representative councils and the political elites are focusing their attention on issues related to the transfer of political power rather than on addressing some of the acute social issues such as unemployment. It's not clear yet how, when, and if the ongoing political changes will lead to major changes in social values and power relations in Arab countries. One would assume that this is something that would happen automatically, but this was not the case in many historical examples. Just think of Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, Romania, Iran. On the other hand, very rarely in history, incomplete political revolutions led to everlasting social changes, such as in France 1968. Toppling dictatorial and corrupt regimes is a very difficult task that requires courage, sacrifices, and perseverance. But changing the social values and structures that produced or sustained these regimes is a very long and often ambiguous process. In the first instance, the political change, the enemy is identified and can be easily targeted. In the second case, the social change the enemy could be us. The beliefs that social inequity and gender inequality are natural and sometimes even sacred and that old age entails social and political advantages are deeply rooted in our cultures. However, these political changes with the accompanying uh, relative freedom of expression make it possible to question such beliefs. This could represent an opportunity for those advocating social change to initiate some investigation on the impact of these values, the values about gender inequality and social inequity and old age dominating 
uh, the society, the impact of these values on our future. It is unrealistic to expect more than that on the short term. But not to be pessimistic. At the same time, it is vital to maintain a vision of free, just, and open societies in our heads and hearts, and to think of every little step we take towards achieving this vision as a victory. This requires incredible strength, as, as we will often be defeated and beaten. This is actually what's happening now in Egypt. We will inevitably doubt if the little gains are worth the sacrifices offered by our colleagues and friends. When we look around for the source of strength and determination, for any source of strength and determination, what is the one source that makes us feel and think beyond our immediate reality? My answer is art. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Basma, uh, searching for the potentials of arts and culture for the social transformation. I think we identified in the, in the first minutes uh, the key word of the keynote is creativity. Thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, we will uh, go deeper what it could be and where it could be. And uh, only one remark from the moderator, because I have only to manage that we are in time and uh, that you will be introduced. But uh, about the age of politicians, uh, we are here in German. Uh, we have some young politicians, but sometimes uh, we see that they are older in thinking than the oldest men and uh, women <laughs> we have. But uh, this is another uh, question. <laughs> It's, uh, it's only to give uh, an introduction to our senior panel, panelist. Uh, uh, he, uh, next year we will have uh, his 80th uh, birthday, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud to meet him for the first time. We, we know uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, artistic work. Uh, he, he was uh, once a time the, the winner of the Golden Lion uh, of the Venice Biennial. Uh, uh, for long life achievement, uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto, uh, coming from, from Torino. Uh, I can make the short version. He is an artist. Uh, he is uh, a solo performer. He is the mirror painter. Uh, uh, we know him very well, but uh, uh, he, he brought, uh, in, in, this is the long version, uh, art into active relation with uh, diverse seers of society with uh, the aim of inspiring and producing responsible social change. And um, if uh, we are now talking, uh, Michelangelo, about what are the potentials of arts and culture for the social transformation, it's uh, up to you uh, as an artist uh, to give uh, a statement and an, um, for us um, an understanding of, of your uh, role in, in the, uh, as, as artist in the society for the society. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, and hello to everybody. Um, I, I'm proud to be, to be here as an artist because, uh, because um, the, the theme is art and society. But uh, I think I'm also proud to be, uh, to be uh, in a certain way recognized as a, 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 per, a person related with social and political engagement, not only to be a, a self-referring artist. Um, I, I want to, 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 to play a little bit with the word that, um, that is um, taboo in a certain way, that is spirituality. 
Hmm? Uh, we speak about society, we speak about politics, we speak about everything, but we never use the word spirituality. That is, 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 is essential, I think, in the, in the context of the society of, uh, and the transformation and, um, and the pro prosecution in the future um, using the mind for, for active uh, responsibility. Um, uh, in, in, uh, for, for, an, for an Italian an artist, um, the, the concept of spirituality was related with religion. We, we always we have been working for representing religious uh, religious team, uh, religious mainly religious, but also also uh, civil representations and so on in the in the in the time. Uh, you know that uh, Italy is is, is, is a, the, a big power. Uh, concern in Italy is um, concerning Italy is the Vatican, you know? and um, the Vatican is uh, is a re really a political, not only spiritual power. So, um, what what happened in the modernity? It happened it, it happened that the artists started to move away from the from the representation of of religion of religion purpose, um, and it started to be autonomous. Uh, and in the middle of the fifties, when I started to work as an artist, I found I found the abstract ab abstract uh, expressionism as a, a point of, of bringing individual uh, capacity of expression and capacity of uh, compression of spirituality uh, as, as a subjective uh, work. Um, each one was making a personal work, a pers personal signature. All the artists were very individualistic. Hmm? But at the same time, this, it was a way to stop to represent this, uh, this uh, religious concept of spirituality and bringing spirituality in, in an individual, uh, in individual uh, power, individual, individual compression. And it is why, at that time, uh, a, 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 big, a big problem of, of uh, 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 this existential uh, conception it was it was bring and many artists get suicide at the time because they couldn't really put together this terrible compression of uh, spirituality in the person and what to do and, and being unable to connect this this compression with the, the, the population with the society and it is why that it was the cri the big crisis uh, of of uh, of the time um, in, in the art. Um, when I started to work, it is we were talking just speaking about mirror for one minute. Hmm? Um, I find the way to to not making a personal sign, but to go away for all kind of sign, even mine, even mine. And, and it is why um, I arrived to the mirror, because the mirror, it, it, is, it is a place where you have all possible vision, you have all possible images of the world, uh, even of the universe, um, without putting anything of you as a decision in front of the others. It is that it, it, it was for me very important because it transformed this idea of uh, of, um, of, of individualistic uh, 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 conception of spirituality and and public traditional conception of religion. So art for me became the place of the activity of the mind based on freedom, freedom because we were free to make everything we wanted to do, but at the same time I find that the freedom is not enough. Freedom, is, it can be everything and nothing. You need responsibility. If you have enough responsibility, as much you have freedom, you will be, you, you will be useful for yourself and for the society. It is from, from that that I created after many passages, I created the Città dell'Arte, the city of art, that is a place where people come from all over the world uh, through, through a university of ideas, and, and we exercise all together a, a research of responsible transformation. 
um, and this, uh, and so we, how we organized all that. We organized uh, all that in the sense that we don't use only the languages of art, but use also the languages of the society. That means all the different sectors of the society are present as, as an elaboration of lang language elaboration. elaboration. And um, so uh, that means that we, we have the, we create a kind of, of nucleus of offices that we call offices of, of, of politics, of, of uh, economy, of communication, of education, of production, all the different offices, because we want to, to look to all the different parts of, of the structure of the society and to try to organize a, a, a real a real project on, on all these fields. For example, for, for, for the politics side, from the politics side, we created um, love difference. Um, uh, 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 and from love, love difference, from love difference is, is uh, an organization f for, uh, uh, for a social transformation in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is a place where many, many different cultures go together, and we have, we have a long story in the past, but big problem of, of today, putting together all, all that. Um, and uh, I think that we, it's important that art take responsibility on, on putting together the culture of the different countries, of different people of the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean area, that, that, that it can be very representative of, of differences in the world, not only in the Mediterranean place, but it can be very representative and because also we have three continents uh, being, being reflected into this, this sea and, and, and with Asia, uh, Africa and Europe. But of course, uh, of course, we, 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 create, we create something that we hope it will go on and we are working for, that is the, 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 parliament, the cultural parliament of the Mediterranean. Uh, we created that uh, three, two years ago. The cultural parliament, it means that we have to, to talk together in the sense of culture before of talking together in the sense of politics and economy. You cannot create a connection in all that, in all that, uh, through all that uh, countries if you don't really, and, and in a durable way, if you don't really start from a, a, an important connection between culture. Michelangelo, uh, may, may I ask you uh, a question to make it concrete, uh, especially this project of the cultural uh, parliament of the Mediterranean uh, area. Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, if uh, artists and cultural people come together uh, to think about uh, the future of the society as an example of what the parliament could do, uh, is this an alternative to the, to the um, official uh, uh, policy? Is this uh, uh, another kind of, uh, of uh, think tank uh, for, uh, for, for policy? Or how is the relationship to, uh, of course, uh, we had this idea of a Mediterranean political uh, Uh, organization, Mr. Sarkozy was uh, thinking about that and... Uh, no, it's uh, not an alternative. It's not an alternative. It's, it's a basic work. It's not an alternative. It is important to, to make the artists more and more artists and more and more more and more cultural organization aware of the power that they can produce in the change. And, and giving information to the politics to 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 bring to to bring the the, the kind of of, uh, uh, of the consciousness that is not directly um, in, in, in imposed by the politic but is moving behind is a kind of underground not, not so much underground but coming from an underground concept of meeting. Of, of, of connecting and, and, become, and f become friendly 
friendly between us, between uh, between uh, artists, between artists, and in, in order to have the possibility to uh, to to have this democratic conception of the capacity of the individual capacity of being a little bit of a, of a gar- government, <laughs> uh, uh, not jo- to have to be democratic in the sense that. Uh, the capacity of the artist to bring in the freedom um, co- in connection with responsibility can offer a little bit to everybody more freedom and, 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 and responsibility at the same time. So everybody can be a little bit more free and more responsible. That it can be the base for democracy. Okay, good luck <laughs> with this project. We, we are here also for asking all of you to work together. Uh, maybe, maybe you will find more uh, uh, parliamentarian people here in this, uh, this plenary, uh, here for the next time. Um, uh, from the Mediterranean uh, region, uh, south uh, to Africa, to Nigeria, uh, Bizi Silva, welcome uh, to our panel. Uh, uh, Bizi is an independent curator, curator. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, 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 you know the work of uh, Mr. Pistoletto? Yes, actually I'm honored to be sitting next to him and to be on a panel with him because um, I, one of my favorite works at the Venice Biennale in 2009 was his work and ah. I took lots of images in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> And, so and, uh, that's really you, great. You, you bought one of his uh, um, things? All, uh, no, I think that will probably take a hundred years for me to pay it off. <laughs> it, it's a pity, but maybe we can arrange something later. Maybe also. he can make a very small uh, mirror. These were large, life-size mirrors. So. Okay, this is founding director of the Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos and was responsible for, for, for several uh, biennials, uh, Thessaloniki, Dakar, and so on and so on. But uh, uh, you are working uh, with uh, uh, artists and you are uh, in a way an artist because you are curating uh, these exhibitions. Yes. Is uh, this exhibition especially in your country and I- in your yeah, uh, 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 around your country, uh, is this uh, something where where you find uh, uh, another identification of uh, 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 the, the role of, of arts and artists for the society? Yeah, I'll just um, give you a little um, background um, with regards to the Centre for Contemporary Art, which was started in 2007. I think um, it's interesting for me to be um, in this kind of um, Panel. But my starting point is the curatorial, and it's actually the artist's work. Although I am interested in um, artists who are whose works are um, about engaging socially. So what I want to do is maybe just um, go through one or two examples of the way in which I work. Um, All the exhibitions that I organize, they're not all um, about um, social transformation. Um, I think that what we do is to provide the platform for artists, different artists, to um, articulate um, their ideas um, within, um, within CCA. But I remember about two weeks ago I was talking with a colleague and um, one of the, um, the discussion evolved around um, can art really transform um, society? And the sort of parting um, conclusion was that, from his side, was that um, art, it's, it's difficult for art to really um, transform society because the audience for art is um, small and most of the my work is visual art so it's not music or um, theatre that has a wider audience um, the, 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 the audience for art is small for example at CCA any exhibition that we do the average audience is about 400 um, although we do about 6 or 7 exhibitions um, a year um, but he did say that um, art can um, transform individuals. Um, you can transform society one individual at a time. And I think that, you know, that's the starting point for um, what we do. 
um, some of the exhibitions that we've done, which I think within a Nigerian context is very important. Um, first of all, just to say that CCA, the, the, the art scene in Nigeria is extremely conservative. Most of the art there are paintings and sculpture that um, are beautiful landscapes or very, um, I would say, banal subjects, you know, mother and child market spa- um, place, and it's usually targeted at a commercial um, audience. And I thought that was why it was important to set up something like um, CCA um, um, Lagos so that we can be more provocative and more confrontational in what we do. So one of the first um, exhibitions that we did, I was actually hoping I could show slides today, but um, um, this is, I guess, not the session for that, um, was called Democracy. And the title is taken from um, the song by Fela Anikulako Kuti, a Nigerian um, Afrobeat musician, um, a human rights um, activist, but also a cultural innovator. And it was three solo exhibitions um, by Nigerian artist exploring the idea of democracy within an African context. You know, what does that mean? Especially that was important within a Nigerian context in which there had been um, military dictatorship for nearly two decades. Um, um, so it was important to explore um, democracy. What does it mean? Is it um, the same democracy that you find within a Euro-American context? Um, what would an African or Nigerian democracy um, look like? What would, we, what would it involve? So the three artists um, came from their own different perspectives. Um, the first artist was um, Gary Okulemi, who was actually somebody that worked very closely with um, Fela Ani Kulapo um, um, Kuti in illustrating the album covers um, for the musician and um, giving a visual um, um, aspect to um, the, the music um, of Fela. But it was also an opportunity um, to reevaluate or recontextualize the work of um, Fela Nikulapo Kuti. 10 years after his death, because um, I felt that the music and the lyrics of um, Fela were actually relevant to what was happening in the country um, um, at the present. The second artist, um, Indidi Indike, um, presented work that um, explored um, slavery um, from an African perspective. Um, a lot of the, um, um, I would say, exhibitions are usually from an African-American perspective. So it was interesting to be able to do an exhibition within Nigeria that um, took its starting point from Nigeria, which, of course, um, was an important um, 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 how would I put it, um, place on the map um, for slavery as it's along the coast. The third one um, was a photography exhibition that explored um, the issue, the social unrest in the Niger Delta. As a lot of you know, um, most of the civil unrest that um, Nigeria has had over the last sort of 20 to 30 years is a result of um, the oil, which forms 90% of the wealth of Nigeria but the region where it comes from, called the Niger Delta, um, is actually um, a victim of um, pollution, um, extreme pollution, where gas has been flaring in the region for the last, I would say, 45 to 50 years. So you can imagine um, um, the havoc that has um, caused to the, um, on the environment. So that gives an idea of one of the exhibitions. Another exhibition we did explored um, sexuality and the body within contemporary art, presenting the work of a Nigerian photographer and a South African um, photographer, um, Zaneli Muholi, whose works um, deal with... um, 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 black lesbianism in South Africa and the challenges um, that a lot of um, 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 the the black lesbians um, experience um, within um, the townships but also within the South African um, society in general but it's also about challenging um, stereotypes of um, um, black sexuality um, as well and um, Lucy Azubuike whose work deals with um, the tensions between um, 
um, the roles of um, women, one in relation to religion, but also um, in relation to the tensions between um, the traditional roles and their aspirations as um, um, women in a modern society. The last project that we did about three weeks ago, actually, um, which was called Occupy Nigeria, um, because as some of you may have um, read on the news, um, um, on the 1st of January, the government decided to remove subsidy of, um, um, on petrol prices, and um, most, um, all the country um, believes that the only benefits that um, we get from the Nigerian government um, is the subsidy that keeps um, prices, um, supposedly keeps prices down and they increased overnight um, the petrol price by over 160 percent, um, which of course has an effect on transportation, has an effect on um, um, food prices, um, something you are probably buying for, let's say, one euro, now became, you know, two euros, 50 cents, and um, of course that will bring a lot of hardship to the majority of the um, population. Um, so the labor union and the civil um, society organizations called a strike, a nationwide strike on the 9th of January. Um, the government um, didn't take any notice of that because um, Nigerians have a notorious habit of um, after the second day of any strike, they all want to go back to work. So they believe that after three days, um, everything, will, you know, they'll accept the price and everything will go back to normal. However, I think the influence of um, the Arab uprisings... Um, um, has had an effect on the way in which um, people um, um, perceive um, their rights and their power. Social media, of course, is very important. And um, the strike um, went on for over a week. And something, a situation in which in different areas, um, on Monday you had 25 people, Tuesday you had you know, 500 people. Wednesday, you had 1,000. By Friday, um, in one area of Lagos, you had 10,000 people. And it wasn't happening just in one area, but in, you know, different areas um, in the city and also across the country. Um, I think people were also interested, you know, they were ready to strike or to stay away from work for as long as it took. Luckily, I think the government noticed that, and over the weekend, by midnight on Sunday, they decided to bring um, the petrol price down, not to what it was, but at least not as high as it was. So we did a project two weeks ago because I think the population felt that the labor... Um, um, the labor um, unions um, sold out. They agreed um, too early to um, what the government was offering. And also, we could see over the week that it now, the, the, the protest moved from being about petrol price to governance, to corruption, to how much the government was costing, to the lack of infrastructure for education, health, and so many other things. And I think the government um, saw that this is now going to snowball into something else. Um, after the end of the strike, um, I think people still wanted to discuss what went on during the strike. So we um, we organized an event in which a lot of photographers, um, we chose the work of about four or five photographers. We projected the images that they took um, during the protest. We invited um, a sound, uh, sound artist who had collected over 5,000 Twitter images, and we had a panel discussion with different um, artists, lawyers, writers, so that they can begin to talk about what happened um, from a cultural perspective. I mean, I'll talk more um, later on. But just to give you an idea of the kinds of programs, you know, that um, we do at CCA, and I said it's, you know, one step at a time, you know, that we can hopefully begin to, as a cultural organization, begin to engage with um, some kind of social transformation within Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. One...
One question more, but uh, before I, I have to thank you that you were so brief. Uh, you told me you were uh, prepared for 90 minutes PowerPoint presentation, so, uh, which were okay because you had a long way to travel to Berlin, but uh, we, we have to be uh, quick here. And, and we heard a lot uh, now that uh, artists could make, uh, especially in the society, these forums, these forums of debates, discussion, of thinking. Uh, and, and we know now um, experience that there, is, there must be more than only a forum. It must be a kind of infrastructure. It must be an institution like uh, your uh, um, a, a gallery and, 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 and this uh, um, possibility to meet and, and to give impulse. And you told us also that uh, social media, of course, is uh, very important. We, we saw it especially in the last two years uh, in the Arabic uh, world and, and in other parts. Uh, But uh, um, one short question and one short answer. Um, of course, uh, uh, if, if you have a, um, a presentation, uh, an exhibition, uh, it's not for, for, the, for the whole public. It's not for the whole society. How many people are in Lagos? Uh, Well, uh, nearly 18 million. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, tell us about this communication uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, what is going on to push it? Is it uh, indeed uh, Twitter and, and uh, uh, your website? And, and, or what is going on? Is there something... Uh, We have in the, in the, in the newspapers uh, sometimes the discussion in the uh, special pages, uh, the feuilleton uh, 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 is also a political debate. Is, is there something uh, yeah, you I, can I use? Think, I think um, now um, that social media is playing an important role, especially in Nigeria. Um, a lot of people are using Facebook. Um, we have a high percentage of um, um, Facebook users and um, Look at Twitter messages that are going um, out and people can instantly say, you know, we're meeting in a certain part of town. Um, why don't you come out? Um, you know, they can communicate that even though, you know, you look at the Western media and you think the whole place is in flames. But, you know, even I went out um, um, to um, gather with the protesters. So I think that the use of um, um, websites, um, um, Twitter, Texas, you know, these are now um, educating people that, you know, you have to be part of this process of change and people are going out. The artist felt that responsibility to go out and document what was happening, um, not only photographers, but now you have um, a, perf a performance artist. He went out and did a performance um, during the protest. You have a sound artist who's collecting Twitter messages. You have photographers who are documenting. So that's really interesting. You have writers. There was a writer who said he collected um, poems um, from um, um, different people. So the cultural sector, which sometimes can be quite complacent, that's within a Nigerian con um, context, with um, um, taking part actively. Um, this time, the musicians were out there, the actresses were out there, you know, really engaging with, with what was happening. So it's uh, the question of networking and the, the question yeah. of uh, uh, action of, of different artists. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another example. We have maybe a very concrete uh, example from Palestine, Alessandro Petty. Welcome uh, to this uh, panelist chair of the <laughs> Urban Studies Program at uh, Al Quetzbad University in Abu Dis. Uh, but you are living in Bethlehem. Uh, and uh, he is director of um, uh, um, an organization which is Decon Decolonizing Architecture Art Residence. And, and there is uh, uh, something uh, concrete behind which could give us maybe an example for uh, active artistic transformation. Please uh, give us a short introduction. Okay. Um. But maybe I would like, because I was very inspired by the beginning of this conversation, so instead of maybe just presenting what we do, I think, I hope that will come out during the conversations, I really like to maybe to engage and to come, to come back to some of the uh, issues that uh, Basma before and then also Michelangelo talked about. 
um, that has to do a little bit with the idea of also political participation. And most importantly for us, the other thing that I would like to do is also maybe bridging another problem that also Basma mentioned, which is this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, polarization or dichotomy between the theory and the practice. No? Um, actually, what I'm experiencing now that the theory is so much, uh, let's say, um, not um, close in and understanding what is really happening, that actually the practice is somehow challenging any kind of theory. You know? In fact, you know, until two years ago, nobody was talking about, nobody was imagining. I have a lot of social scientists, friends, very good ones, sociologists, anthropologists, ethnographer, uh, activists, and none of them understood what was boiling. No? So in that sense, I um, now have learned that actually we have a little bit to reflect on what is happening out there and then to see how this actually can influence our work. So it's, in that sense, it's also bridging maybe the assumption that we have theory that needs to be applied, but more importantly is actually understanding first what is happening there in order to actually to see how we can engage in, this, in a dialogue, you know, in, in this kind of possibility. So one of the things that we... Um, began to reflect, and this is what I would like to, to share with you today, is the notion of what is the public and what is the common. And especially this in Palestine, um, we found this was crucial in understanding, because sometimes when we say what is the public sphere, it seems that we all know. But if you look what is the public today in the Arab world, it's different in what we maybe can imagine here in Berlin or, or in Europe. Okay? The public is something which is always associated to a state, right? A structure that has its own political representation, which is then expressed to parliament, municipalities. Okay, this is the public. And most of the time, we think about public art, we speak in this name of the public. What we are reflecting on is most important the notion of the common. And the common is a different, a radically different from the public, because the common is activated by the people. And I'll give an example because I want to be concrete, right? Um, I realized that Tahiri Square was transformed from being a public space in a common place when I saw people cleaning the plaza. This very banal act that uh, it was uh, performed, it's a clear manifestation in the Arab world that this is place is belonging to you. Because in the Arab space, since the state has always embodied, and the public space always embodied the other, it's not yours, it's state. It's not yours, okay? But when people started cleaning up the plaza, this was a common space. This was something that belonged to you. You're taking care of the place. And this is why Tahiri Square, Tahiri Square was like a city, no? it was start to be organized, something that was not anymore, let's say, the roundabout that was conceived uh, for uh, belonging to the state, okay? It was turned in a, in a different function. So we are very much interested in understanding these kind of practices that then are very much contagious because the all Occupy movement, all movement uh, it's all about reclaiming these spaces, have been expropriated by the public, okay? So the paradox, and, and coming especially from, let's say, a kind of architectural perspective, no, that comes always that whatever is public, it's good, no? It would be impossible to think that, you know, the public could be something which is not actually for the people. And I'll give you another example. In Palestine, for us, it's the real manifestation of how the public expropriate what is our common. Uh, in Palestine, whatever have been, uh, let's say there were different kinds, in relation to the land, there were different kinds of uh, common spaces. And all these spaces have been expropriated by the state of Israel and transformed them in public. Public means only Israeli used. So this was killing any possibility for the Palestinians of having any common space. And common spaces were not something abstract, were inscribed in law, were inscribed in practices, were inscribed when people were cultivating the land altogether. This was not even signed, but were used in a kind of common space. But then it comes to state, a colonial state, and says, this is public. Public is not yours anymore. Public is the state. And the state, in fact, then is manifested through the colonization because all the settlements are built on public land. This is one of the, our, even in a way, in that way, we even had to actually read back to our own projects. And we understood one of the first projects was actually reusing the Israeli settlements. And we didn't realize that most of the settlements, 99% of the settlements, the Israeli ones, are built in public. 
public spaces, but these spaces were common. So these were expropriated from the people. They were not, the intended will say, we don't expropriate private land, but this relegates the Palestinian only into the private sphere. There is no possibility of, of having, let's say, something which is collective, okay? Sorry, I just... Uh... <laughs> wow, sorry. But this is... Let's say, this is what I've, I'm trying to learn, right, from, uh, from outside, how this is also goes back to our own practice, okay? The other point, I think, that was briefly mentioned, that I've learned, it has to do with political participation and representation, no? And one of the projects that we um, uh, engaged with, it was how we can reuse the Palestinian parliament building. It was built, actually, in Abu Dhabi and, and never been used. And then we realized that the very idea of a political representation is something that it doesn't actually say anything about how people can really participate. So I think here, what we, again, we can maybe um, learn as a lesson from, uh, uh, from the Arab revolts and revolutions, the Occupy movement, is actually that here there is an invention of people understood that through simple having somebody represent you doesn't work. Okay? This put in question the very idea of democracy. Okay, the very idea in which we think that this is how democracy works. You have a parliament. No, it doesn't work like this. All of this movement says the political participation is I'm a person and engage into politics. Okay, there will be nobody that have to mediate or translate. Okay, because then you end up in you know, a system in which you are completely disconnected. And this is also, let's say, goes back also into, into a dimension which is people finally understood that in order to um, politically being relevant, you have to occupy spaces, okay? And for us in Palestine at the beginning, we had this kind of strange feeling because occupation for us, it's like something very problematic. But at the end, you know, we were very happy because maybe we say, you know, always our work is about decolonizing, uh, let's say, spaces. Maybe also we can start to decolonize the very world of occupation, no? So in that sense, it was also important to say people uh, understand that, you know, you have to be in what was before, in the origin that of, of a public, you know, like a presence in the city, people understood that this is why people were ready to, to die in Tahrir Square, because they wanted to stay there, because they understood if they would be removed from the physical space, everything can disappear. And they still feel that going back, it's keeping alive their political participation, beside all of what is said about social network, okay? It's fine, it's okay, but let's say it's much different the fact that actually we have to have a presence in the city in itself. And this is, again, a practical example is in Bahrain, which is one of the revolutions that you know, people will not like to talk about for many reasons, but in Bahrain happened the same thing, and the, and the regime understood and destroyed the peer uh, roundabout. Okay, because they exactly understood that this was the center of the politics. This was their parliament. The parliament is not what is you know, supposed to, what you had in mind when I say parliament. The parliament is today, Tahrir Square, the roundabout in uh, Pearl Delta, was in Tunis at the beginning, the boulevard of, of Bourguiba. There are all these places where people feel that they can actually open something which is new, something that actually is so much advanced in terms of practice that all our theory, so in that sense we have to reconcile that and try to understand how this practice are actually changing even our own definition of what is the common, what is the public and what is the private. Thank you. I think it's... Uh... And it, it's... It's, it's very clear uh, and uh, very connected to that what uh, Basram say, uh, Basma said, because it's uh, the, 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 the creativity of, of the individuality that that means and, and the individuals that uh, that it's uh, uh, you must be part of, of that and uh, this is what uh, you talked about. Uh, could you give us a, 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 a concrete detail uh, if you are planning such a project? In changing, what 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 is uh, the, the participation? Uh, is is there uh, is everything open? Is there everything uh, dedicated to the, the people who are interested to, to live there in uh, later in this uh, area? You are you are an architect. That means you are. Uh, uh, 
also a kind of, of artist creating uh, uh, a daily life with, uh, with, your, with your work. Uh, what is the concrete uh, uh, participation in this, this planning process? Again, it's, it's like what is concrete is also maybe changing um, the ways in which things are narrated. No, not necessarily they are expressed in, uh, maybe in physical terms, but for us it's also maybe engaging in, in how people see things no? and, and opening up dialogues. And this is for us, for example, because we ask about also the idea of, of participation. And, and again, it's one of the terms which became very tricky no? and very... Um, uh, somehow part of, of many institutions no, that says, you know, we like to engage in participation. And I say this also as its own problem, no, because it uh, is done, again, on the name of the public, it seems everything is good if it comes with the public participation, also as this assumption, no, that if you ask somebody to participate, it's a good thing. And I'm, I'm questioning that, because participation, for example, most of the occasions is actually trying to co-opt consensus, trying to actually bring people in this way that says you participate and your conflict will not be considered like something we, we, we cannot negotiate. We can manage somehow this conflict. No one comes and talk with us. And this is also the problem that I have with the parliaments. There is a lot of you know, discussions, but actually there is no political action somehow. No, this is something that also remains in this kind of field where all of these things are as to do with, uh, with trying through participations to co-opt uh, co people. I think that maybe there will be also a moment, this is why most of these movements, the first thing is no to something, no? Is no to say no. In that sense, it doesn't mean that you would not engage, but actually you are questioning the platform that are offered to you in order to be co-opted no? in, in these kind of discussions. Uh, and then there is a lot of work of, you know, that we are, uh, again, maybe... Um, I'm not sure if this is the occasion to talk about you know, our projects, but it, it will be more important for us maybe trying to bring some of these reflections and, and critically, I think, engage with these terms, no? because this, what I suppose, will be terms that will be then part of calls for artists you know, to, uh, to help people to participate. I think it will be also important that if we accept the part of, of self-criticism is actually also to question these notions, because there will be no notions that we, we have to be in constant movement, because all of this will be somehow, uh, after years, um, part of institutions and part of certain kind of politics. And these are terms that can be really uh, used as a, as a sort of, uh, of trap, so that artists finally, they find themselves you know, in, in this kind of situation, which instead of being artists, they end up to be, uh, since now we demolish the, the welfare state, you know, so any state will say, I will send some artists, they do some social work for them, and they try to keep the people a little bit you know, in, a, in, a, in a better situation. So in that sense, I'm also questioning our own role no, in this struggle, because in certain moments, since also we work also in, in refugee camps, we know very much, let's say, how certain political entity, they don't have any possibility of being negotiated with the idea of, of a state. I mean, how a refugee would enter no, in an idea of a nation state. By definition, will never enter there. So the only thing that you can do, you can somehow manage this kind of exceptionality, right? And this is, I think it's for us, important trying to understand how we are locating ourselves and our work you know, in this kind of uh, situation in which the, the, the state might operate you know, in ways in which the welfare state is uh, almost, let's say, not there anymore. So, and the artists, they, are, they have social responsibility, are being used, and this is you know, true also for other NGOs and for other people that work with society, and we have to understand how we locate our work in function of, of, of these issues. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, you will not feel... Uh, 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 very much exotic uh, to tell us, uh, uh, and I mean uh, especially the, the, the hosts and uh, the, the German uh, participants, how, how it could be uh, to participate in, in, in planning your life. We have wonderful examples. Uh, one is uh, called with Stuttgart 21, where uh, 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 maybe your experience uh, uh, had uh, helped very much uh, years ago uh, with uh, 
uh, with this project. Uh, 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 last but not least, normally uh, the politicians start uh, if they are asked or not, but uh, um, Antanas is uh, very different uh, uh, politicians. May I introduce you to Antanas Mokos, the former mayor from Bogota. Uh, um, it's uh, wonderful to have you here because uh, you are coming just from Stuttgart uh, 21 because uh, there is uh, something uh, what you can tell them how, how to manage uh, it uh, with, with the people and the policy but you are uh, also um, working at the university and uh, uh, as, I, as I know you are uh, an excellent uh, uh, expert uh, also in, in literature and, and the arts but um, uh, uh, of course you are here because uh, you, you had the responsibility uh, of, of cultural policy uh, uh, in, in, in your city and maybe you can tell us uh, uh, in, uh, from the point of view of your city and uh, it's also 8 million or what, what is it around? Seven million uh, people and, uh, and and the country in in, in transformation. Uh, uh, what is your experience and uh, um, uh, what is your key wo word uh, uh, to to manage uh, um, this potential of the arts and culture? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, empowerment, creativity are something close to art. Artists operate on the restrictions they put themselves. If I am an artist and I go to jail and I have a marker, I can write a line and reduce my space. And from that can come elaborations. So less is more. But there is freedom to accept some restrictions. In my case, I am being accused or felicitated because of using art in, in government. Really, what I use is pedagogy. But many times in my life, I have been put in the corner. My normal way of working is arguments. It's Habermas, ethics of communication, reasons, rational. But sometimes you cannot be rational. You are put in a corner. And then emotions count a lot. And many times I have asked to me, my, asked myself, what would do an artist in my place? I remember I had promised to do not speak to people who hide their faces. And they got in a situation where I had to speak with them. There was an official intermediation commission, a very tricky one. We were on constitutional change in the country, and they had occupied a part of the university. So I took a seat. I seated like that. And I said, the people with the kabuls can enter in the room. I asked them to... Uh, put up, but I will not risk to know them and to identify them. And I don't know if they listened and, and spoke without Kabuls or with Kabuls. But we found a sort of non previsible way out. There are also some small events that are important as sort of condensed perception. In Colombian surveys, politicians have 6% of trust. And teachers are 60. Each time I go in a hotel and I have to put occupation, <laughs> the temptation to say I'm a teacher <laughs> is total. Some moments of inspiration. One night, a homeless recognizes me and shouts, Antanas, I've got my ID card. Just that sh sh shouting voice. When I have to define citizenship, I can use Hannah Arendt's short definition, it's the right to have rights. But the image that I have, the sound that I have, 
is this homeless? A girl with prohibited fireworks because each year there were 300, 250 wounded people with artisanal fireworks. One girl after that, seeing me in television on the day that she was on the third birthday, asked to have a visit to the mayor. So I was uh, very proud, a girl of three years once as a gift for her third year to, to know me, vanity. And the mother explained to me that they lived both, both uh, in a poor neighborhood. And the child saw me working on this story of fireworks. And we took some water, some, some sweetness, sweet things. And they were going out. And the mother said, hey, Mr. Mayor, I was forgetting to tell you something. Each time I'm going to hit her, she takes the telephone. She doesn't know how to mark the telephone, but she says she calls you. <laughs> I was skeptical about all the movement of human rights and so, and that girl taught me, exactly. Obviously, on the next day, I was, well, I had in my development plan fighting intrafamiliar violence. But that was one sentence in 5,000 sentences. After that visit, the next day, I was meeting with psychologists and psychiatrists, and we invented the so-called vaccine against intrafamiliar violence. It's a, it's a very strange thing, and I have not repeated it. But we made two Sundays, separated by one month, a sort of installations. 50,000 people got through on first Sunday, 30,000 got the second. It was a strange thing, and technically, perhaps we have today a lot of doubts. But a psychologist, a psychiatrist was receiving the, the people and asking, who, who has hurt you the most in your life. Here there is a balloon, draw the face of the aggressor. Now we put the face on a body full of balloons, and the psychiatrist or the psychologist says, if you meet with him, suppose he's here or she's here, what would you say or do, him or her? Allow yourself. Half of the cases, people aggressed physically. The first time we did, the aggressor was the father of a small boy. When the small boy was going to explode the head of her, her father, I was intervening. The psychiatrist was cutting my hand and saying me to, to the here, sometimes you have to take part. And so she deculpabilized uh, she helped to reduce guilt feelings. Okay, we also made it by, by phone. I was on television three times taking the, the vaccine. Once it was an allegation in Lithuanian language with my mother. Another was a professor who was hitting. I had short pants and in face of my colleagues, he was hitting uh, my legs. But the third case was a gallery owner, a story that I never have told nobody. No my parents, no the therapists, no the girlfriends, nobody knew about that story. At Sunday, this man was teaching me rest, re wrestling in his gallery uh, that was closed. and. Technically, he didn't uh, undress me, he didn't violate me, but I had no words to describe the experience. And I knew that that was an experience taboo. Okay, so when I made this with television, I got very upset, and I said, if you like men, search adult men, but with the voice, not. With the voice, not. So... I'm very clear that emotions are a very dangerous thing. Artists work with emotions. Artists elaborate emotions. Artists create emotions. Richter's 
Pinchers about Bader Meinhof ban exposed one year after the 11th September in the Museum of Modern Art of New York. It's a very kind way of reflecting and helping to change in a collective manner the appreciation of terrorism. It's exactly the contrary of just declaring the other the enemy and allowing yourself any mean to ex exterminate the enemy. Hatred is very different from indignation. And in my country, in Colombia, part of my work, also the work of Cesar Lopez, who is here, is don't hate, indignate. Indignation is localized. When I am indignated by something that you did, I am scolding, you say, uh, uh, demanding you to feel guilty, etc. But it's part of you. It's not you complete. When you de decalify completely a human being, you are determined to an uh, annihilate it. Well, not all was so serious. We used mimes instead of policemen traffic in part of the city. The journalist that first asked a question when we presented the initiative said, could the mimes put fines? I said, of course, mimes cannot put fines. The journalist said, it will not work. It worked. Why it worked? Because when you introduce art, Efficiency is not the only criteria. There are other criteria. There is some mysterious thing about what is the game here. And the, the, the journalist was reflecting a very wide, diffused uh, pre prejudice. All people, as much as we have made a lot of service, Many people, I should say, they say, I obey by good reasons. For me, pedagogy. But for the majority of the people. So, carrots for me, sticks for the others. So, inverting, a little more sticks for me. And a little bit more carrots for all the people could work. And another initiative, I promise it more more taxes. The first time it was a sort of joke. I had the sort of luxury of saying I will be elected even if asking more taxes. It's not normal, but it will happen. It's, it's playing a little bit. But the second time I was elected, the need of new taxes was very clear. We had an economical crisis with people with 30% less income in real terms. So we had to take taxes and to build quickly a bigger capacity of having people in public schools and in public hospitals. The councilman said, you were elected for rising taxes, but we not. So they didn't approve the taxes. So I introduced an oxymoron, voluntary taxes. In Spanish, it's impuestos voluntarios. It's... it's it's totally con contradictory. And 63,000 families, about 3% of the families of Bogota, paid 10% more voluntary taxes. In that moment, the councilmen accepted the taxes. If they would not do, we had descriptions of what would not do the city, very concrete. In your neighborhood, this will not be done. And also, for example, in a bus station called Heroes, we had the names of the 10 first person who paid voluntary tax. We had meetings. One woman, well, in many cases it was trust. It was social justice that motivated the payment. But one wo wo woman said a very beautiful thing. I know, I know, it, it happens all, 
All the time. You, you, are, you are going to say the last sentence? <laughs> so, a woman says, this year I can't pay more taxes. Her freedom. Normally, if I ask you more taxes, it's stable. Here, it was a possibility of paying as much taxes as you can afford for one year, and you can program. So my dream is that some academicians will take that idea, coming from a playful way of solving circumstantial problems, to programming tax through life. If I want to have a ch a children in three years, I can pay two years higher taxes, but I can ask the, 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 the state to be less demanding on me on the next years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Was it, uh, was it a politician? Was it a professor? Was it a performer? Uh, 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 we saw a wonderful introduction in a kind of policy uh, uh, which is very much dedicated uh, to the people. We, we have to come uh, to an end, but uh, this is the power of culture here on stage, so we can tell them, all the uh, managing people in the back, that we will sit for five more minutes because we will finish it uh, uh, with another statement uh, from, from Basma, because uh, uh, I would like it's not uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the really f final word because all of you will be involved in, in several other uh, groups. But uh, I, I would like to mention uh, this book I, I read uh, before we met in, in Cairo. It's about cultural policy in Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and so on. And um, with the help of the European Cultural Foundation and coming from, um, from a first uh, a meeting in Beirut, and uh, uh, we, we started with, with, with the idea of, of Mrs. President, uh, uh, what kind of cultural poli policy should it be to, to make all this possible, also your uh, special involvement. And I know you have a concept in the pocket, but uh, this is uh, uh, for, for another uh, a meeting. But maybe you can uh, tell us one or two uh, important uh, uh, pieces of, of, of this concept of cultural policy you would like to fight for. Um, before... Before talking about what, we would, what kind of cultural policy we would like to see in the Arab region, uh, the, f the, the fact now is that no Arab country has any kind of document called cultural policy in place at all, with the exception of Palestine that has such a document, but it's put on some shelf and not applied. So, but the mere notion of having a written cultural document is, is, does not exist in the Arab region. And this is why we've been advocating this and working on it since 2009. Now, what kind of cultural policy we would like to do, uh, would like to see in Arab countries uh, is not really something that we have a ready-made idea about. And we don't have a fixed theory. Uh, we think that the um, uh, arriving at a cultural policy should be a process that is participatory, democratic, and open, and should involve all active players on the cultural scene uh, in every country. It's not something that government bureaucrats should uh, write in closed uh, sort of meetings, but uh, it's something that can be initiated by, the, initiated by the civil society, which is happening now, because uh, as the result of this uh, research, which uh, Professor Schneider mentioned, we now have national cultural policy groups that are uh, led by the civil society in Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, although it has been suspended for now. Uh, so these people are not only monitoring what happens on the cultural policy level in these countries, but are drafting cultural policies and alternative uh, legislation uh, in these countries. And we hope that by the end of 2012, we'll have uh, proposals published proposals for cultural policies in at least three Arab countries. And we'll have this in Arabic and English, and of course we'll be happy to share it with everybody.
Thank you, Basma. Uh, you can imagine that as a professor for cultural policy, uh, I could talk uh, the whole day about this. And uh, I, I was listening very well uh, the role of the civil society. And I think this is something uh, we should discuss uh, on because uh, you are not on, list on the street. You are not on the public space. You are uh, working for the common uh, place. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this... There was an introduction to that uh, what 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 the EU initiative uh, initiated uh, with with this uh, conference and and we are coming back but I, I would like to uh, to finish with with something is coming from uh, uh, from the German Bundestag from the, the Parliament not far away from here uh, and it's uh, uh, it's one of these documents and uh, it uh, it is uh, coming it's a quotation from the uh, from the enquete commission. Uh, culture in, in, in Germany, uh, which is now five years old, but I think there is a lot uh, of text in uh, where policy could uh, react. And, uh, and, and in this chapter one about the meaning of art and culture for individuals and the society, there is one sentence I like very much, and this is uh, why we have to talk every time uh, about cultural policy to make it possible. All that uh, wonderful examples uh, you gave us uh, in this morning. I, I will make this, uh, this quotation. If someone discusses and claims freedom and dignity of every individual, presents this in contrariness, offers the symbolic forms in which we can be fought and particular lived, then this substantially happens in the medium of the arts. Individuality and social bondage are specified through the arts. Herewith, the arts take effect far over the seer of artificial communication in the society and form their human determination of aims. And therefore, we need a cultural policy which understands as a social policy that allows, defends and organizes arts and culture. Coffee break.